Good morning, and thank you for joining us for another episode of the Transformational Coaching Podcast. I'm your host, Coach Hyman, uh, coming to you live. It is episode four of season two of the TCP, uh, and we are rocking and rolling in the second season. Um, it's now early August. Uh, we started back going middle of July, uh, and we are now uh, on our third episode of the Build Better, Build Better series. Uh, where we've just been focusing on uh, some of the different aspects of coaching, some of the different aspects of of the game in general. Um, I know our first Build Better episode was uh, Building Better Hitters, and in that episode we focused on a lot about our our batting practice structure and and what we're putting our kids through every day uh, to ensure that we're putting them in game-like situations to really put an emphasis on the key moments in the game that help us win. Um, and really help us become better executioners uh, of the important parts of the game, which ultimately help our confidence and build us into better hitters. Um, episode two of the Build Better series, we focused on building better culture, uh, and that's something to me is vital. Um, is something that if you don't have great culture, I think I probably should have made that episode one, because if you don't have great culture, then none of the other stuff matters. Uh, and then today, uh, we are going to work on or we're going to talk about building better outfielders. Um, so building better outfielders is going to be the third part of the Build Better series. Uh, not sure what part four is going to be, but I'll be thinking about that over the next week. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's uh, if you haven't had an opportunity to to tune in for season two, this is your first episode, go back and check out the other ones because I think there's something for everybody, whether you're a player, a coach, a fan, a parent, grandparent, whatever. Um, there's something you can pull and pick up from in each episode. So give us a try. Um, go back and listen. And outside of that, we've got <laughs> about 30 other episodes you can listen to as well that kind of focus on different aspects of the game, uh, different aspects of building a program and things like that. So um, before we even get going, again, thank you for the feedback and and the amount of attention all this stuff has gotten. I mean, we've I haven't checked the views lately, but we kind of shifted towards I'm trying to do more of a YouTube presence uh, since we added video into this. And, I, you know, I'm trying to hit everybody who can, you know, depending on how you like to listen or watch or whatever. Um, but the YouTube has picked up tremendously. The one thing I'll ask you guys to help us with is if you can subscribe and like any videos that you watch, that'd be awesome. Um, and that just kind of it gives analytically it gives us a few more things to where we can kind of focus on. Okay, you know this is the sweet spot as, as sweet spot as far as timing goes. You know you lose people at this point, things like that. So as you subscribe, you can see all that. Um, when you don't subscribe, it just makes it a little bit more difficult, and it just helps the validity of the program as well. So <clears throat> having more subscribers um, is a good thing. So. I appreciate your feedback. I appreciate your help with making that happen. Um, and outside of that, that's going to be our intro. Now, I'll, there is one touchy subject I do want to talk about, uh, and I'll talk about that in a second. But just, you know, you're sitting here, you're like building better outfielders. So I've been to enough coaches clinics to know that <clears throat> when – this part of the clinic comes up and the guy's going to stand up and talk about outfield play. Normally everybody goes and eats lunch or goes and makes a phone call or goes and, and does something else. Um, that and base running. Those are the two parts of the game that people really probably under coach and under, I guess, under appreciate the importance of what those two parts of the game do for your chance of winning a game. Um, so my job today is going to be to try to change your mind on that and talk to you about the things that we do and focus on uh, to try to make sure we're putting ourselves in position to be the best outfielders. Um, and there's some things of, in, in within that that intertwine with base running, so we'll talk about that. But we'll get into all that in a minute, but I just kind of want to give you a heads up of kind of what to think. Now, yeah. I've talked a lot on this podcast in the past about um, kind of where we are as a community, where we are as culturally, as just a nation. Um, if you break it down a little bit, a little more narrow focused on just like athletic parents and grandparents and any, any kind of stakeholder 
uh, any young person who's playing at uh, playing athletics labs. Um, we're not in a good spot. I'll just be in real with you. Um, and as a whole, we've got to do better because I think, and, and I'm not, what I'm about to say is not a knock on, you know, our, our parents. It's not a knock on people I've coached in the past. It's a knock on the system as a whole. Um, you know, when I got into coaching, if you follow me on Twitter, you would, you'll see where I threw a post up a few days ago about a high school coach, a high school coach by the name of coach Butch Chaffin. Um, and when I got into coaching, you know, I had people that I had surrounded myself, myself with personally, um, that did a lot for me. Your Kirk Corbett, your Kenny Gray's, um, your Rhodes Dickerson's, Trey Allison's, Brian. I mean, all these, all the people, Bowie Olson, you know, all these people that I coach with currently and have coached with in the past. You surround yourself with people like that who are great men and they're great coaches and um, they put you in a position to be successful. But somewhere along the way, I started listening to a podcast called, um, it was the ABCA podcast at the time when Coach Jeremy Sheetinger was, was doing that. I think it's Coach Ryan Brownlee does it now and it's still great. Uh, and then Sheets moved on to do um, – I cannot remember the name of his podcast now. But anyways, he moved on to do another podcast, um, started another one. And he, like, weekly – and the ABCA podcast does the same thing. They they bring in the best of the best around the country, whether it's professional coaches, softball coaches, baseball coaches, high school baseball coaches, uh, showcase coaches. I mean, it's just – if you never listen to the podcast, it's it's a game changer for it was a game changer for me as a coach. I know it'll be for you as a coach if you're somebody who's constantly looking to try to improve and and learn new things. But anyways, um, there's been a few high school coaches nationally in my life uh, as a coach that I've really come to have a lot of respect for. Uh, and I've talked about Coach Justin Deemer on here before, um, you know. I think he won 88 something. Yeah, 88 straight games in high school baseball. That's crazy. Three straight, three straight state championships. Like when you see people do stuff like that, you look to them for guidance and how to learn because they must be doing something right if they can do that. Um, another person that was vital was a guy named Butch Chaffin. And uh he was at Cooksville High School, I believe is what it's called. And you know, he's involved with USA baseball. Uh at the younger levels, I think they he coached seventeen or eighteen U national team, um, but he resigned recently from his position at Cookville, and, and it might be Cooksville. I, I always get screwed up, but anyways, and um, it's a travesty to the game of baseball that that type of guy, um, that type of leader was ran out of a place that he had been to. He had been for thirty plus years, um. It speaks poorly about their administration, the people running their athletics program, the way they did him, uh, and the reasons behind why they did it. I mean, for me as a coach, is something that I've, I've actually over the last couple of days I asked myself, like, is this kind of where we're heading? You know, are we moving into a society in high school baseball and high school athletics, athletics in general where it's not about what you've done for me overall, it's about what you've done for me lately? And uh, it's not a good culture. It's not a good spot to be in um, because I think our job as high school coaches and part of the reason why I do this podcast is like, hey, we're trying to build better athletes, build better people, build better coaches. Like we're trying to build better everything so we can send them out into the world and be better in a world that's fundamentally broken and so screwed up right now. Um there's not enough good men. There's not enough good leaders. There's not enough good supporters of anything. It's, it's, it's a travesty. Um, it really is. And it's because of society, we've lost our focus on the things that are important and we've become so, so tunnel vision on, you know, things that really aren't all that vital, you know? And when a guy has been somewhere 30 something years and done the things he's done athletically and his resume speaks for itself and he's ran out of a place because you've got some people with kids in the program um, that have a little money and a little influence and they don't like this or don't like that. Um, it's a damn shame. 
And it, may, it just made me ask myself, like, is, is it what we're doing as coaches? Is it really worth it anymore? Because, yeah, 30 years ago, you could coach kids really hard um, and you could put building great young men at the forefront of everything you do. And I'm going to continue to do that. Um, but today, you, you know, back then it was acceptable and, and people wanted you to coach their kids hard. They wanted you to teach their kids life lessons. Uh, they wanted you to do all these things, but now it's like, oh, well, I want you to do all those things, but I also want to make sure my kid plays, or I also want to make sure my kid plays the position I want him to play, or, you know, I gave money, so I expect my kid to have a spot on the team and blah, 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 blah. It's just, it's a shame. Um, and I don't want to make this whole podcast about this, but, you know, if people like Butch Chaffin are being ran out of this game because of bad apples with influence and, and money and, and whatever, then like, what does that say for guys like me? What does it say for my coaches, guys who don't have near the, the track record and near the resume that somebody like that has? guys that are following in that footstep to try to build great men first and, and all that. And, you know, if you win some baseball games and you build a championship program, that's, that's a great secondary option. They, they, they normally work together, but, you know, at some point you can do everything right and just not have the athletes. And, um, you know, I think his, what he did this past year as a coach, given the, you know, kind of where his program was this year from a talent standpoint was, unbelievable he's one of a few people who could have done what they did this year where he was as a as a as a you know from a talent standpoint um and that's no knock on the talent they had it's just I think they were young and you know had a stretch of guys that weren't as maybe as good yet as the guys they had in the past no different than like somebody like Andy Hallett right now you know I thought what Andy Hallett did with his team this year as young as they were was incredible um but anyways I just I think it's a it's a travesty um, and we got to get a hold of it. And I think somewhere along the way, coaches, parents, supporter of the program, administration, uh, all that, we got to get back to the table and remember why we do what we do. And it's, it's not to soften the world for your kids, man. It's, we have to use athletics to show them what the real world is like. And we have to teach them vital lessons and in the process of doing that, they're not always going to get what they want. And as a coach, I'm not going to always get what I want. I'm not going to go 26 and up. Okay. I'm, I might go 25 and two and still not win a state championship. That doesn't mean that it was a failure. Right. Um, we have to remember like the end game here is there's lessons to be learned with everything that we do on the field through practice, through struggling, uh, through not getting we want what we want the day we show up, but having to go fight and earn it without the help of mom and dad going to the board, reminding people that they have deep pockets and, you know, pushing their influence around on people. Um, you know, at some point is a, from an administration standpoint, we have to move past like, well, I don't like that coach because he doesn't do this or doesn't do that. But. And, and see that the things that they do do well, like. They're building great young men, great young women. They're sending good people out into the world. They're doing all those things. It trumps whatever your political, um, politically motivated, or you know, just don't like somebody. What like whatever? I mean, anyways, just it's frustrating. Um, that's all I'm going to say about that. We just have to be better as a society. We have to be better. And and listen, I'm not knocking solely knocking administration and parents. And I'm definitely not knocking anybody within my own program. Um, I'm just saying in general, um, they y'all have to be better. As coaches, some of us have to be better. Some of us have gotten extremely complacent where we're at. Some of us deserve some of the bad things that happen as a result of us not constantly, us not reminding ourselves why we got into this. Um, and I say us, I'm not speaking about me or my colleagues. I'm just saying across this country, it's not always the AD and the school board and the parents' problem. Um, sometimes it's the coach's problem. That's very true. Um, but we all just have to be better. I mean, it's, I, I, I couldn't believe what I saw uh, when I saw that that guy had resigned and was basically forced out. Um, it just – 
it made me question why we do what we do. Because if he can get ran out for pissing the wrong person off, like what's a guy like me going to do? You know, um, at what point is the wrong person with the wrong, you know, with the deeper pockets or or whatever going to going to be upset about something I say or something I do or, you know, not playing their kid where they want to play them. And somebody's going to say to me, hey, man, <clears throat> yeah, you made the wrong person mad. So we're going to make your life difficult and and, you know, run you out of the game. It's just it's I didn't get into this to play politics, you know. I got in this to make sure that we were sending good men out into the world and we were putting our young guys into a position where they could accomplish everything, what everything that they want to accomplish through this game while also learning a ton of life lessons um, and helping them be better men. Same way that I want them to take from this game, the same thing I took from this game. And then hopefully because you have the right people motivating you along the way, you end up in a situation like I'm in where I can turn around and repay it repay a game that did so much for me. So that's all I got on there. We got to do better, man. We got to do better. I'm challenging anybody who listens to this. If you're part of the problem, let's try to become part of the solution, including myself, because me getting on here and talking about this, this is me bitching about something, inventing about something, but this isn't really me delivering a solution for it. But my job moving forward, my goal moving forward is how can we make this game better? How can we make this environment a better environment where great coaches uh, don't end up in really bad spots like Coach Schaffin did. So, anyways, all right, that's that. Back, uh, didn't mean to get all emotional. That just kind of things had me fired up for a few days. All right, but let's talk about building better outfielders because <clears throat> if you're fortunate enough to continue coaching, um, you're going to have to have really good outfielders to be able to do what you need to do. So, um, kind of the, the outline of what – today's episode is going to look like uh, we're going to talk about first establishing the key principles of outfield play. Um, and that's going to vary from coach to coach. Uh, you know, my philosophy maybe isn't the best, but I'm here to share my ideas and, and maybe you can pick up something new. And hopefully if you listen to this and don't disagree or have something you can add to it, you'll let me know. Um, but I, we need to establish the foundation for first for outfield play. Uh, and what's important. Um, then we'll break in just kind of execution of everything. And execution is, you know, practice execution, drills that you can use. Uh, everything to everything from that to your pregame routine to in game management. I mean, all those things are really important um, if you're coaching outfitters. And, and I hope if you're listening to this and if you're a coach, you know, I think one thing that's is vital is. You know, if you're a head coach, making sure you have people who are willing to learn and continue to grow at different positions, like as position coaches, you know, for us, it's vital. Like my job is to do base running and outfield play. You know, we've got coaches who do infield play, catchers, pitching coach. Uh, we all kind of share a same philosophy on hitting. We always all work with those. But you need to make sure that you have like if you're fortunate enough to do it, man, get you a volunteer assistant, get you a guy you pay $500 a year to be a specific position group coach. Because when you're trying to execute on these things, it's you can't build great outfielders by standing at home plate and you're working with the infield and then you're hitting, you know, then you're trying to hit fungo to the outfield and you're, you just can't do it. Like being a great outfielder requires, you know, building great outfielders requires daily work and it requires having somebody who, you know, has a plan on how you're going to get there. So, um, that's that. Um, so, and then we'll obviously con conclude or close this thing down, uh, at the end. So, all right. So, uh, key principles outfield play. I've got four things here. Um, you know, and it starts with just understanding our job as outfielders. So, you know, any any team I've ever coached, they're going to be able to, if, if at any point in time you ask them what's your job as an outfielder, uh, they're going to tell you one thing, one thing only. My job as an outfielder is to limit guys, limit base runners to 90 feet or less. And that's the foundation that I'm, I build my entire outfield coaching philosophy on is your job as an outfielder is to limit guys to 90 feet or less. Uh, and you have to understand the value of that, right? Um, 
But people look at me sometimes when they say, well, what do you do with your outfitters? So, well, I mean, step one is mentally and, and like the foundation we're building on is like, what do you start with? Like glove work, footwork. First day of practice, we sit and we, we spend about 15 minutes talking about the value of an extra 90 feet, right? Uh, well, uh, and we'll talk about that in depth in a minute. But, you know, you think about an outfielder and their job in the game, you know, their job. Yeah, it's catch fly balls. That's a given, right? What our job really is, though, is, you know, on the 50-50 ball, can we get it into an infielder's glove fast enough to stop a guy from getting an extra 90? You know, can we make a great play every once in a while, a diving play or whatever, to limit that guy to 90 feet or less? Because we, you know, we had already given up the single in our mind, but then you can make a you make a great play on a 50-50 ball and you limit that guy to less than 90. It's an out. So that's kind of what we're talking about with that. Um, you know, and because that's our foundation, the next step is understanding the value of an extra 90 feet. And, you know, we really establish the value of an extra 90 feet, uh, every day when we work base running and things like that. And that's why it's important. Like if you're going to take this route, it's important to make sure your base runners understand the value of extra 90 feet, because that will help drive your outfielders to see, to understand like, Okay, if 90 feet is that important to us offensively, it's mega important that we stop the other team from getting that extra 90 feet. Um, you know, and so how do we defend against the extra 90? Well, you know, it starts with good throws, right? Starts with good throws. Uh, and it starts with, you know, taking proper angles to balls and you know, having great footwork, making good reads, you know, those are all things you're going to, you're going to work with, work on daily. But the biggest part of that is understanding that the only bad throw in baseball is a high throw. Um, I, if you go watch a high school baseball game, you will see, if you go watch 10 games, 10 games, you'll see an extra 20 runs created because guys can't hit their cut guy. It's a fact. I watch it happen all the time as a, as a coach offensively, we teach our guys as they're rounding first and they're looking to take an extra bag, they're watching the trajectory of throws because they know, they understand what a bad trajectory looks like and what a good one looks like. And when we see bad trajectory, we don't hesitate. We take an extra base. Um, and if you watch good base running teams, all of them do that. You know, hit a ball to left field. You got a runner on second, hit a ball to left field, and he throws it over his cut guy to the plate. You just gave up an extra 90. Right. You just screwed up on what your job is. Your job as an outfielder was to limit a guy to 90 feet or less. Your job as a base runner is to understand the value of an extra 90 feet and take an extra 90 feet. Right. So um, that's like one of the biggest things, like as we talk about key principles, outfield play is understanding like the value of an extra 90 and the things that we can do to stop that extra 90 from happening. And. 90% of the cases are guys don't make good throws to their cut guy. They throw it over his head. It's totally inexcusable. If you watch 10 high school baseball games this, this year, um, you will see it happen one time at least every single game. And when you start talking about that extra 90, you know, you got to drill that home. You got, And when it happens in game, you've got to, you've got to like, you don't have to beat them up about it, but it's like, hey, like, let's bring it back here and understand what we just did, right? We had two outs, okay, or we had one out. We had one out, runner on second, ball hit the left field. We sail the cut guy because we gave him a high throw. The guy who should have been at first with the double play still in order is now standing on second. Okay, so no double play in order. They have two guys in scoring position with one out. So a cheap hit to the outfield is now probably going to score too. It cho totally changes the dynamic of the game. And you have to I, – I think you have to break that down for your guys because at the end of the game, at the end of the season, okay, there will always be a few moments like that where your season probably could have come out a little bit differently had you executed in those situations. You know, I'll tell you, friend, this is not an outfield thing. This is a base running thing. Um, in 2019, I believe it was. No, it may have been 21. 
It was 21. It was the year following COVID. You know, the reason I'm the way I am about base running is because we lost to May River in the first round of the playoffs after he'd won 20, after we'd won 20 something games, won a region championship, went into the playoffs, number one overall seed. Uh, we lost because we didn't execute a secondary. We didn't read a ball off the bat. We took a terrible round around the base and we got thrown out by a tenth of an inch, a tenth of a second. And we that's not why we lost, but that moment has fueled me from a base running standpoint. You know, there's two outs. We weren't aware of the situation. So, and we had a lead runner. So we weren't being aggressive enough with our secondary. We were late on the secondary. Ball on, ball put in play. We were late getting getting going. Okay. And because of that, we took a bad rounding angle. So we took ourselves out of the play, got thrown out of the play by, ten, you know, a, a tenth of a second. Uh, Would have won the, uh, end up losing the game on that play right there. And that just, set us totally back on set totally back in the playoffs of the year. And that team was probably one of the best teams I ever coached from a talent standpoint. But, you know, that's what changed for me and helped me understand, okay, like these little things that everybody wants to overlook, they're vital. Okay. And outfield plays the same way. You know, you look at that play and how it panned out. Okay. We got a guy first, second, two outs, hit a for sure double down the line. Okay. Outfielder bare hands the ball at the fence. No hesitation, gets it in. They're running double cut there, gets it in. Perfect throw to the relay guy. It sails through the first one, but, you know, they play it. They played it perfectly. But I remember looking at that whole play saying, like, everybody gets up and walks away at a coach's clinic when the base running and outfield section comes up, right? But right here, this moment, this game was won and lost because of a great outfield, a great outfielder who picked the ball up with his bare hand. That saved two tenths of a second. He hits his cut guy. That saved five tenths of a second. Okay. Made a perfect strike to the plate. Okay. That saves time. And then we cost ourselves time around the bases because of what we didn't execute on. So, those are the things when you break it down like that and you think about your season, you know, all that you put into it and everything else, it's worth being really good at those things and coaching yourself up as a coach to make sure you're putting your your guys in a great position. Uh, because, you know, throwing strikes and, and hitting in key moments isn't the only thing that's going to – is going to get you there. And if you're not coaching yourself up and really emphasizing your guys the importance of these things – then at some point it's gonna burn it's gonna it's gonna burn you. Um I got off on a tangent there. I apologize. But I'm just passionate about those two things. And you gotta break it down to the brass tags and you gotta understand how you win and lose baseball games and outfield play and base running are how you win and lose baseball games. It happens every single year. Okay. All right. Next key principle. <clears throat> and this is a big one. Your outfielders have to play with no fear. They have to be ball hawk, ball hawks, hawks. I said that weird. Um, you got to you got to be the no fly zone. You know, Seattle Seahawks back in the day when you had Richard Sherman and all those guys, they were the no fly zone, right? They didn't play timid. Uh, they, they just went after. They hawked the ball, man. They just went after the ball. The same thing with outfield play. You cannot. You're the only guy on the field who can call. One, two, three, four, five, six different, six other guys off, right? So when we're coming forward, we got to be looking to make a play, not to, not for somebody else to make a play. It is what it is. I, I see this happen. It happened to us over the summer. Um, key moments, you know, that in between ball, coaches, you know what I'm talking about. The 20 footer off the back of the infield, where your your right fielder, or left fielder, or center fielder is coming in, and your second baseman's going back, and your your outfielder's looking for the infielder to make a play, and the infielder's looking for the outfielder to make a play. You know what I'm talking about. I know you know what I'm talking about. Um, we've got to establish a ball hawk mentality with our outfielders because on that ball, our outfield should never be looking at the infield. They should be seeking the ball, looking to make a play. And you have to instill that in their minds. 
okay? It's the only position on the field where you're looking to make a play, not looking to somebody else to make a play. Not the only position, but it's it's more imperative uh, for outfielders to make sure they're seeking the ball. It would be like a, a, a somebody trying to seek contact on a football field. You got to be looking for contact. You got to be looking to make a play uh, and all that. You can't be worried about other people and everything else. You dictate how that play is going to end. You have to establish that principle. You have to put guys in, in positions where – they're comfortable barreling in with an outfielder barreling out and communicating. Fly ball communication, you should work on it at least three times a week, uh, preferably with a hack attack so you can – or, you know, fungo man, something like that, so you can replicate those balls that people give up on, that your outfielder pulls up on because he's worried about running into your outfielder. Your outfielder pulls up on because he's worried about running into your, your infielder. Um, if you don't work on it, if you don't put your guys in situations, then don't be surprised if they don't execute in the bottom of the seventh when, you know, you need that one, that one run to that one out to advance. Right. Um, and then the final thing is just understanding the value of great feet and great eyes. So, <clears throat> you know, for us, we believe, you know, we've kind of talked about the key principles of outfield play. A lot of people think that, you know, it's great glove work or whatever. You know, you got to have a great glove to play outfield. It's not true. You got to have great feet and got to have great eyes um, because your eyes are going to tell you where your feet are going to go, right? Um, and that initial second when the ball's off the bat, when the ball comes off the bat, the trajectory and all that, you know, that initial reflex your body tells you to go in, out, back, um, you know, drop step this way or drop step that way or – I've drop stepped the wrong way, so I got an inside turn back, or I've got a you know glove side turn back to the play to get a chance. Like you got to have great feet and great eyes. Um, you got to work on that stuff every day. Um, and we'll talk about kind of the execution of that later. But uh, as as an outfield coach, you know, that's the first thing I'm going to look at is you know, and that's what we're going to drill first is great footwork. Um, just because you got to have a solid foundation skill wise and that starts from the ground up, in my opinion. It, goes, it actually kind of goes from ground to eyes to glove. Um, but we'll talk about that. So those are our key principles for outfield play. Uh, understanding our job as an outfielder, which is to limit guys to 90 feet or less. Uh, understand Our guys need to understand the value of an extra 90 feet, because if they understand that, they'll understand the value of the small things, like the good throw, picking a ball up at the fence with our hand instead of our glove you know, stuff like that. We got to be ball hawks. We got to be seeking them. We got to be seeking to make a play, not for somebody else to make a play. And then we have to understand the value of great feet and great, great eyes. And we've got to work on that every single day uh, to put ourselves in a position to be able to be the complete outfielder. In my opinion, the complete outfielder checks all the boxes for the key principles we've talked about today. Okay. Um, So the next thing we're going to jump into is just execution wise. You know, what does that look like? And uh, we'll talk about some practice and drills, pregame routine, all that stuff. And I've got some opinions on this. And again, I, all this stuff is just coach at a skis, a 4A skis of school in Darlington, South Carolina, which I still think they're in Florence, but they say they're in Darlington. Um, this is my opinion on these areas of the game. So if you share a different opinion, that's cool. Um, this works for us. And I'm always down to learn new things. So if somebody listens to this and you think, hey, man, you said this, but I kind of think this, like, let's talk about it because it might make us better. I don't know. Um, but so, again, it's I think sometimes it can come off like, man, this guy's just like telling, all, you know, no, it's not that. It's just like this is what works for us. This is my opinion. Um I wish more people would be willing to step out of the box and throw their stuff out there. But anyways, all right. So from an execution standpoint, the most important thing here is having a plan, right? Um, we'll talk about building better practice plans and stuff like that at some point on the build better series. Cause I think it's vital for me as a coach. It changed a lot of the way that, you know, we prepare when we started doing better at practice planning. Um, but Practice planning for outfielders is vital 
to ensure that these guys are perfecting their craft. Like you have to have a solid plan on how you're going to get them there. You know, going out there and hitting them 50 fungo, you know, 50 balls off the fungo is not a good plan. It's just not. Okay. Can't tell you how many times that, you know, you see people that, you know, well, all right, outfielders, go to your spot. Okay. We're going to, I'm going to hit you one, you know, one handed toss from home plate. All right. Throw it to second. Okay. Throw it to third. All right. Throw it to the plate. All right. You're done. Get out of here. That's not good outfield play. That's not good practice for an outfielder. Okay. Understand when you go down the practice planning route and coming up with a solid plan for your outfielders, it's going to get boring. Tell our guys all the time. If you watch the way we practice, you'll say after like the third day, you're going to be like, all right, that's a, it's not really all that exciting. You know, we're going to change it up occasionally and, and do some, add some different things into the mix. But for the most part, if you looked at us every day, you would see a lot of the same stuff minus about 15 minutes every day. Um, because everything we do practice wise is built on a plan and built on the things that are going to help us be really good. Outfield play is no different. Uh, if you watch the way I do pregame infield after my guys throw their bases, you'll see what we do every single day. It's part of our process every single day at practice. Um, you know, it's boring, but it's necessary. Right. And um, I think our guys understand that. And, uh, you know, you can change it up and do some things differently, but you do need to have a good foundation for, you know, drilling these things every day and 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 being able to replicate the things that they're going to have to do in game. You know, when the pressure's cooked up and the lights are on and it's a big moment and they get a bad read off the bat and they've got to correct themselves and make a play like you got to put them in those situations and situations like that enough to where it becomes comfortable uh and everything's good so um that's why it's important to have a plan and that plan should be a lot more than just go to your spots throw to three bases and get out right um so drill wise you know some of the things that we do and think some some of the things i believe in if you don't know who darren fenster is uh darren fenster has a really good series um on outfield drills he was with the Red Sox. I'm not sure if he's still with the Red Sox or now. At one point, he was their base running and outfield guy. I think he's their infield guy now. Um, but he he introduced us to something called read and reacts. Um, and, you know, I guess let me take a step back. We'll talk about read and reacts in a minute. But, you know, your drop step drills, triple cuts, um, triangle drills, all that stuff is just, it's, that's the basic, that that's basics. You need, you should have like a five minute session every day of just, you know, quick hips, good feet, you know, working on proper drop step, working on, you know, triple cuts where you drop step, triple cut it or cut in, cut out, um, things like that. It's just, we start every day that way. Um, and then as we progress and get really good with our footwork, then we start every day with our read and react series. If you haven't seen a read and react series, Dar again, Darren Fenster, look it up. Um, if you're not a member of coachesinsider.com, coachesinsider.com, I think it's 99 bucks a year. Um, and there's a ton of like really good drills there. So if you're like confused on well, what's a read and react drill or, you know, what are some other drills, man, like literally a library of like 900 drills. It's incredible. I didn't realize six years ago, I didn't know there were that many outfield drills, but I mean, the thing for us is just look through it and you find the things that are important to you and then you kind of make changes as you see fit that fit your style. But, you know, our read and react drills are going to incorporate what we've learned from a drop step standpoint and actually put a ball into it and force them to react one way or the other. So, you know, our guys, when they show up to me to stand in front of me, we do one at a time. They've got a ball in their hand. They're going to and they're in their like they're playing outfield position. They're going to toss me the ball if I catch in my right hand. They're going to drop step that way. If I catch them my left, they're going to drop step that way. All right. And then we do a read and react series based off that. So first time through, they're going to toss me a ball. I'm going to catch it with the hand. Next time through, I'll catch it with the other hand. Okay. That's going to be station one, set one. Um, then after that, we're going to do a read and react chop. And a read and react chop is, you, I guess you could call it a mystery. And that's where if I catch it with the right hand, you're going to chop, you're going to drop step with the left. And then inside turn back. The right way, we're going to throw the ball, all right? Um, 
you know, that's part two of that. And then, you know, read and react will do uh, after that. We can, you know, you can do a bunch of different things. We might do our right, read and react inside turn. So that's, you're going to drop step to whatever way we catch the ball and then you're going to inside turn and catch the ball that way. Um, or we might do uh head turn. So you're going to drop one way and then you're going to shoulder turn. You're going to, instead of cutting inside, you're going to go back and then just shoulder turn and catch a ball that you had a misread on. Um, there's a lot of things you can do that. And then we always end it with like a, with a, uh, a two ball drill where, they're going to drop one way. They're going to catch one over the shoulder. The minute they catch that, they're going to start taking off the dead center field and they're going to catch another one on the run. So that's it. it I need to probably do a video of this and that's what I will do. I'll follow up with some type of video on this so you can see it done uh, in real time. because It's kind of hard to visualize. I'm realizing that now I was trying to talk about the read and react drills, um, how hard that is to to replicate when I'm talking about it, but it's, for me, it's one of the biggest things that we do. Um, when I started with my guys at Trinity, they had terrible feet. Um, just being honest with you. And in 10 weeks, their footwork has gone from a D minus to, you know, B and in the fall, we'll get them up to an A and by the spring, we should get them to an A plus. Um, but as you do this stuff every day, it becomes normal. And the uncomfortableness of, you know, all this stuff and them not being, it's like a deer when they, a baby deer when they stand up for the first time. They don't, they just look awkward. When you do this stuff every day, they're going to look awkward. Um, but as you do it more, you're like, I, I love seeing people that commit to this and how good they are two, three years from now. Um, you know, I've talked about J.R. Williams on this podcast a lot. I've talk, but talked about Wyatt Williams a good bit. Those guys were outfielders for me, Nathan Galls. Um, trying to think of who else had who was really good from a footwork standpoint. Landon Hill. Um, you know, these are all guys like when they show up, they're not very good footwork wise, but like, you know, they could go out there and teach the whole daggum thing uh, now and teach guys how to be really good. But they committed to that and they went through this stuff every single day and they didn't complain about it. It wasn't, you know, yeah, it may have been boring, but they found a way to get better and work on the things they need to work on. And as a result, there's some of the guy, there's some guys with the best feet work, footwork that I've ever coached. Uh, and that's vital because when your feet are good, you don't have to think about anything. You just have to get the right read. Uh, your eyes got to be right and your feet are going to get you to where you need to go in the most efficient way. Um, so that was the long thing about reading reacts with some other drills you can do. Um, you know, we use a hack attack machine every day in the outfield because I think it's important to replicate fly balls and then get as many as possible. You know, so our guys, will, some days we'll do short machine fungo where they're 10 feet from the machine. And we kind of work on these things we're talking about where it's like a short three step burst drop step. And they're catching a ball that's coming off the machine on like a two, two, three setting um, where it really stretches them out. And we get a lot of reps in in 15 minutes Every guy's going to probably see 30, 40 balls off the machine in that time period, to keep it running. And then we have some days where we do machine fungo uh, at 250 feet. Um, it just depends. Now, you know, the thing about this is that we should be maximizing reps. So if you've got two coaches, one to feed the machine, one to be out there actually coaching some things, do it. Um, I set the machine up in one spot and then our guys change locations. For me, that works best. Instead of trying to change the machine every time, the only thing we do is change trajectory and change spin on the machine. So if you're doing hack attack fungo, um, do that. You know, set your set eight cones at eight different spots in your outfield. Or what I'll do is Aiden Palmer always let our outfield sessions when they would catch their first two balls. I tell Aiden, all right, pick the next location. And it's amazing those dudes try to challenge. You know, you got it figured out when the dudes are trying to challenge themselves with the locations they pick. You know, they might come in 50 feet, you know, go back 75 feet, you know, start 50 feet left to where the ball is going to land. You know, they do they they do all that stuff to challenge themselves. And that's one of the best things you can do. But by changing location, you can dictate what you want them to work on. So if I know I'm shooting heavy backspin ball to center, you know, and I, I mean, we normally just set it up in foul territory and left field. But, you know, if I'm doing heavy, heavy backspin ball, you know, straight, then, you know, I might start them the first round 
25 feet in of the landing zone and 25 feet left and then get them to kind of drop step to their left, catch that ball moving to their left and swing that line back around to the right. And they'll do the same thing going right. And then maybe we'll start them deep and I'd come into their right and then start them deep, come into their left, you know, bring them 25, 25 feet in front of where the ball is going to land, you know, get their back to the play and go, you know, there's a million things you can do. And in 20 minutes, you can get everybody a ton of work. If you do it every day, it's so much more valuable than standing up there with a fungo and just letting it rip. Um, I discovered that a couple of years ago. I'll never go back to hitting fungo. I've hit one fungo, fit fungo one time to have my outfielders. And that was like six weeks ago because we had to get our pitching machine fixed. Um, but machine fungo is game changer, you know, cause it's going to replicate what they, what they're going to see off the bat. And the good news, if you look on Twitter, um, there's people who've done the work for you, you know, so I can't remember the coach's name, but I got his literally have his, his chart screenshot and it's on my phone, you know, and he's got a high back spin ball. He's got a lob ball. He's got a wind ball to the right, a wind ball to the left. And like what the junior hack attack settings have to be on to replicate that, you know? So let these people who've done the work for you, um, use it because it works. And uh, you can just replicate a lot of different types of balls, you know, uh, you know, hey, this is going to be a left-handed batter. Okay, so we know the ball is going to slice away from us to our right, uh, or it's a right-handed batter, so the ball is going to slice to your left. I mean, those are all things that are important and you got to replicate. If you're just standing up there feeding the machine with, you know, on 7, 7, 10 settings for 20 minutes and you're not doing it with pace and you're not changing location, you're probably wasting your time. Uh, and your kids are really going to get bored. Um, but if you're changing location, changing spin, changing trajectory, and you're challenging them, that's the key, challenging them off a of machine fungo. Um, you're going to get really, really good. And I speak from experience on that because we had, in my opinion, some of the best outfielders in the state the last few years. So um, the final two things that we like to do, uh, we don't like our outfielders to just shag during BP. Uh, we like them to get live reads off the bat. Um, so I would challenge you guys. Um, it's easy to just send a group of four out there or, you know, a group of six and just tell them to shag. But if you got outfielders in, in those groups, you know, I probably would set your one year group to or two year groups to heavy outfield, make them go to their spots and make them take live balls off the bat. Um, it, it's just, it's the only way to like really, I mean, the machine fungo is great uh, and I love doing it, but the one way you can just train those eyes, train the feet, uh, train your reactions and, and your reads and all that is seeing it live off of the bat. So um, you're going to get the best feedback off of that. So just people feel differently about that. I just, my opinion is don't shag during BP actually field. And um, then the last thing, and this kind of goes back to, you know, understand your job as an outfielder, which is limiting guys to 90 feet or less, right? We do something called pressure defense uh, with base runners. And, you know, what we'll do in that situation is, you know, our base run, we'll have base runners at the plate um, and we'll have a coach with a fungo. This is one of the times you will hit, use a fungo. And I guess technically you could use a hack attack if you wanted to, or a pitcher machine, but our base runners are trying to stretch it as far as they can stretch it. And our outfielders, their job is to throw that guy out. And this is a great drill for both people because it helps base runners understand what their limitations are. So for instance, you know, we've all seen this ball ball hit the left field with not a lot of pace straight down the line. You know, one of those balls that's going to get through the infield, but it's going to basically be sitting on the left field line by the time your left fielder gets there. Uh, it's a 50-50 play for a base runner and outfitter on who's going to who's gonna throw who out on, who's going to be safe and who's going to be out there. Um, but we'll do that. You know, we'll hit that ball down the line that's not, you know, going all the way to the ball, and, and we'll make that outfielder, you know, try to throw that guy set out at second. We're going to force that guy who's running bases to try to beat that throw to second. And the benefit there is, like, it helps your um, – it's going to help your outfielders kind of start having that internal clock of like understanding like how quickly I got to get to something, 
and how I can trim five tenths of a second off of getting ball out of my glove and in the air. Um, and then for your base runner, it's going to help them understand like, Hey, if I'm booking it out of the box, I can be safe at second on a lot more plays than I thought I could. Um, so we'll do something like that. We'll change where we're hitting the ball, but the whole job for that, the base runner is to like, just book it as far as the play will let you go. And the outfit is like, get to the ball and try to make a play, make a play at the bag with the throw. Um, so those are just a few of the things that we like to do. Um, you know, outside of drills, you know, pregame routines really important. And um, we made a shift to our pregame routine this year. I remember kind of watching what we previously did. And uh, I remember telling Coach Rose, told Coach Gray, like, guys, I, I you know, I don't want to, I'm not knocking on what we're currently doing. It's fine, but you know, we got to do away with the feel good be uh, feel good pregame for our outfielders, and uh, we got to cut the pressure up, cut the intensity up, because they got to be ready when the first play of the games hit down the line, and they go from like feel good pregame to oh shit, I got to make a play, you know. And there's there was two times this year where our pregame routine paid off for us on the first play of the game. One time in Lugolf Elgin, and huge game for us. Uh, second round of the playoffs, and then one time in the lower state championship game. Um, both were hit to Wyatt Williams, and both times he threw a guy out at second base on a ball that was 50-50 ball that I firmly believe if we if we did not go through pregame routine to go ahead and put our guys in those game-like situations, we may have come out on the different end of that. So, um, you know, consider what you're doing with your outfit. If you're going, okay, hitting a ball straight to a guy, and he's throwing it to second, hitting it straight to a guy, he's throwing a third, hitting it straight to a guy, he's throwing home, you're, you're not putting him in a good situation to execute on the first pitch of the game, right? You know, if you're hitting the first ball to the left fielder down the line and he's having to get to it, bear, pick it up with his bare hand and shoot a, throw a strike to second base, you're getting him ready for that. On the next round, if you're hitting it in the left center field gap and treating it like there's a runner on first and your left fielder is going to go pick that up glove side and then turn glove side and throw a strike to third base, you're doing it right because you're putting your guys in these situations in pregame that are actually game like they're going to have to execute uh, once you get to like in 15 minutes when the game starts. That way they've done it. They're ready for it. Um, they learned something, got their heart rate up. They did a lot of good stuff there. So. Um, the next thing is after they do their pregame and the infield starts theirs, get rid of the ripping fungos, man. Like have a process. I, I got rid of ripping fung fungos pregame this year. Game changer. We get their heart rate up. We get their muscles warm. We take them through a read and react series. Ours is, you know, going to be read and react left, read and react right, read and react chop left, read and react chop right. Uh, and then they're going to go two ball. So they're going to go right, catch a ball, sprint, you know, sprint towards center, catch a ball, and they're going to come back and go left, catch a ball, sprint towards center, catch another one. And then we always end it with ground balls. And I don't hit fun, I don't hit ground balls. We got to stand there with the bucket and rapid fire ground balls, and they work on coming through it, just rolling it to them, you know, from 10 feet away. Um, and that's how we finish. And uh, it's a game changer. They – their heart rate gets up. They're nice and warm. They're ready to go execute as soon as we're done with that. Um, and then always, you know, from pregame routine standpoint, once you're done doing that, give them some verbal cues. You know, uh, give them a give them a talk about the field conditions. Remind them of their jobs. Hey, what's your job as an outfielder? Hey, coach, we want to limit guys ninety feet or less. Okay, playing surface, playing real good. Uh, not going to get any bad bounces here. Ball staying low to the turf you know, blah, 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 you know, pay attention to those things and just give them a nice verbal cue and remind them. I don't know if it helps or not, but I just think it, you got that extra two or three minutes with them, make sure you say something impactful and something meaningful, right? Um, and then once you get done with the pregame aspect, you're going to be in game. And I think whoever your outfield coach is, you need to be on the same page of what's going on from your pitching coach, uh, what's going on with your, you know, from a scouting report standpoint. I mean, I, we were very fortunate at South to have Coach Rhodes Dickerson and, you know, the 
the amount of scouting he did on our opponents from a spray chart standpoint. I mean, there wasn't another team in the state of South Carolina who was more prepared for where guys were going to go uh, than we were. And that was just a, a direct – I mean, that was because of him. Um, yeah, he did a great job of making sure we had all the information we needed to be able to put our guys in a position to – to be ahead of the play. And, um, you know, so as an outfield coach, I had to stay linked up with him about, okay, what are the tendencies? But I also had to stay linked up with our pitching coach on what kind of where we're going, what we're calling in case we need to make some, some shifts or pivots off of the placement that we had. Uh, so that's important. Um, also important, just good, good reminder to your guys to win check, right? Wind check, wind check, check the wind, know the wind, you know, something. Try to do that when I start seeing, you know, we try to train them that after every out, give a look to the flag, give a pull of the grass, you know, so we kind of have a feeling because, you know, where we played at South, you know, the wind normally only blew in two directions, but when the wind was really howling, um, it would kind of shift around a lot. So, and that'll burn you if you're not prepared for it. So, you know, just understanding like, okay, hard wind coming off of the football stadium is going to hold the wall, hold the ball up. Okay. Wind coming in this way is going to cause it to slice a little harder, you know, and that changes depending on your position because a hard wind coming off a of left is going to hold it up and left, but it's going to push it away and right. So, you know, your guys just reminding them, reminding them of that, um, is, is important. And then, you know, the final thing to that is just always, you know, pregame management wise is making sure we're constantly reminding them, right. Of situation, you know, when, when to let it rip, when to sell out, things like that, you know, you got a got a runner on second base, got a runner, you got a runner on third base, one out, uh, bottom of the six, you know, whatever, you know, we need to be reminding our outfielders, Hey, like it don't do us no good if you catch a fly ball here to just throw it through the throw it to the cut, man. Like we gotta let it rip. Um, or hey, on this one, hey, we're going through the cut on this, we're going through the cut. Hey, let this one rip. Hey, two bags ahead here on the ground, you know, whatever. Um, just any kind of verbal cue, and you'll come up with your verbal cues. I mean, for us, I've let it rip is a big one for me. Through the cut's gonna be another one, two bags ahead on the ground. Um you know, no doubles, you know, whatever, just, Hey, okay. To sell out here, you know, as far as like understanding, like, okay, you, you know, when are we in a situation where I, I can risk it for the biscuit or are we in a situation where I need to be willing to, Hey, no doubles on this one, you know, so on that one, maybe I'm pulling up if, if it's a, if, if it's a 50, 50 ball. So, um, those are just some things from execution standpoint that we've got to do as coaches and players. So a reminder, execution um practice planning is vital it's going to be boring at times but it's extremely important to perfecting their craft make sure that you're putting them through the proper drills every day um and it's got to be an everyday thing like i know i i go through this sometimes like man we do this every single day like some days you're not feeling it but the minute you take the the focus off of it what you're telling everybody else is it's not that important and our guys are already 50 50 on whether or not it's important or not so when we start taking days off from it what you're telling them is it's really not that important it's really not that important for you to catch that ball over your throwing shoulder coming in it's really not that important that you know you come through that baseball or you feel that off of your left knee or you know whatever like you got to make sure that you're constantly drilling it and putting the focus on it because if not they're kids and they can begin to think well it's hey as long as i catch the ball it's good well no that's not always the case um execution make sure your pregame routine's tight you know my advice is to eliminate the fungo um and have a little system that you run through after they throw the bases make sure the pregame pregame routines putting them in game-like situations and not just a waste you know of of, of time and space um and then in-game management's key as an outfield coach you got to make sure you're doing your part to put your guys in the position to be successful and reminding them of the situation, remind them of the win. Cause you know, the good outfielders do it for you, but 
it's always a good thing to just stay on top of, make sure everybody's on the same page. So, and that's all I got on uh, building better outfielders. Um, one full hour of talking about that. I was impressive. I was worried that I wouldn't have enough content to fill out a full hour here. But once you get going on that, it's, you get kind of passionate about it. I played outfield briefly in college. I played outfield my whole baseball career. Uh, well, my whole career once I got to high school. Um, originally, was a third baseman and shortstop like most people. And, you know, for whatever reason, they moved into outfield and it just became home for me. Loved it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the big thing again there just for coaches, parents, players, whoever listening um, is – there's more to it than just catching baseballs. And uh, we've got to make sure that we're putting our guys in, in the situation to really understand what's important about outfield play. And it's not just ball getting in glove. Uh, again, for me, it's, you know, first understand what their job is, is to limit guys to 90 feet or less. Right. And, you know, once you understand that, we got to understand the value of an extra 90 feet and why it's important. We prevent guys from getting that extra 90 feet. Um, and then we have to have that attitude that, you know, we're a ball hawk, like nothing can drop. We're looking to make plays. Nobody's going to take this play from us. And then the last thing thing is just understanding the value of great feet and great eyes and then doing what you can every day to continue to work on those things. If you take care of those key principles and then your coaches, coaches, you're putting your guys in the right situations daily, you're going to have great outfielders. And state championships are won and loss, in my opinion, by – teams that can't run base that are the differentiator is great base running teams and teams that are great at playing outfield. Um, because at some point the small plays that really make the big difference, you normally can tie outfield play and base running into those plays and the teams that execute on those plays, they're normally standing at the end. So it is what it is, but um, that's all I got again. Thanks. Thank you for joining in for another episode of the TCP and the build better series here. Um, not sure what our focus is going to be next week yet, but I'll start planning on that and working on it now. Um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate all you guys for, for continuing to listen and follow us on this journey. Um, you know, I was thinking about the other day, you know, I understand why I'm doing this, but I, I was like, I wonder how many people have listened. It's like, what is this dude doing? Like, or, you know, what's, why, why do you see this as being valuable? And, um, can't remember who it was, but they, they were like, dude, I just love listening to your podcast. And they're like, man, every once in a while, you kind of like say, say some things like, you know, I wonder what other people, I truly don't care about that, but I do think that there's some valuable stuff on here that if more people would tune in and we have a tremendous following, but I think if we could, we're not quite to the masses that I'd like to get to you to currently. And that's why I need y'all's help. Um, because I think what we're doing is a good thing. And I think we're genuine in what we're trying to accomplish here. And that's building better athletes, building better people, building better coaches and all that. Um, we got to find a way to just get in front of a few more people so we can continue to grow. Um, I do am planning on bringing back the coaches series. Um, and I might break the build better series up by bringing on another coach. I know a few people have been wanting to get on. So uh, that's going to be, at some point here, very soon, we'll start bringing a couple coaches in and, and give us a little bit of break from the Build Better series. Um, if that's getting a little boring or, or, or you know, whatever I'm thinking about, there's not many aspects of the game left outside of like catching, infield play, pitching. Uh, so might have to, might have to, might have to break it up a little bit and bring up, bring a couple people on to interview, talk about what they do. But, um, we're going to get there. And again, I just appreciate each and every one of y'all for what you do for, for choosing to spend an hour with us an hour plus sometimes watching the video, sharing it with a friend um, and all that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everybody who continues to help us grow. Um, again, please like, please subscribe. If there's anybody who you think could benefit from listening to this, please share it with a friend. Um, and, you know, we'll just, continue to do what we do and hope that we're getting the message out to the right people. So um, that's all I got. Thank you again for tuning in and uh, we will talk to you very soon next week. So until then be cool. Go Titans. See ya.